All right. Welcome, everybody, to Armageddon PSYOP, the movie. This is where we're just kind of going over some introductions to the different actors, kind of going over the script. This is a very beginning stage. We have no commitments, but we do have the movie script out. And so we're going to be talking about that. Let me go over some introductions here. First, Rick Welch. Um, most of you know him. Without Rick, this would have never been possible. Uh, Rick <laughs> runs a popular podcast called B Burrows of Berea. And uh, Rick, how is it that you knew about the movie script and the pr movie proposal that I was working on? I even forget about that. Oh, well, you, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I have that little tacky tie films thing that I did where I was just making my own little films. Right. Um, low. When I say low budget, I mean low <laughs> budget, but it was a lot of fun. And we just had a conversation and you said that you had an idea with the treatments from uh, Armageddon Deception and that you were looking for somebody to write the screenplay. So I introduced you to Zach, um, Zach McElrath. And then we met with you and then he wrote that script and they kind of did some back and forth. And then that's when Pat came and got involved. Cause after that was done and they send it to Pat. So that's how I got involved. Yeah. And uh, yeah, without your graciousness with Zach, uh, it, it could have never really happened. And I'd always prayed even in the back of Armageddon deception in the appendix, you'll see two movie proposals. Kind of one is kind of a cross between the kingdom of heaven, Ridley Scott and uh, the Gladiator, Ridley, Ridley Scott, and kind of combine those together into a into a preterist movie. But this is the updated version, and uh, the one that I think is the most important for our time. Then, of course, did we lose Pat? It looks like we lost Pat. It does. No, no, no I'm here. There. I just oh, when okay. I'm when I'm not talking, I just turn off my screen. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, Pat Militich um, probably doesn't need a big introduction. Most people know him. He's a former UFC champion and a Hall of Famer champion at that. Pat has been involved in some movies. Uh, Bobby Z, I think, is probably the most famous movie you were in. Is that correct, Pat? Uh, yeah, safe to say a Paul Walker film. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne, the Carradine Brothers, and several others were in that one. And I did some, some uh, fight scene work. Uh, choreography and uh no it was it was uh it was a great experience and i love that triangle in uh in bobby z in the in the kitchen on the stove <laughs> that was those were some really good fight scenes you did a great job you actually were you you played a fighter in that in that movie as well i just played a bad guy and rob lawler yeah. rory markham tim sylvia chuck lydell dan mcgee so there were a bunch of fighters that uh were cast in that as basically bad guys and so and all the fight choreography because the book had no fight scenes in it the original director had no fight scenes in it and they hired a, a friend of mine as the director i mean as they were getting ready to start filming literally and john hirschfeld said i need you to put together some fighters and i need you to put together some fight scenes down there you know because normally fight scenes are choreographed for quite a long time before you know ever ever even getting to where you're filming they've already done them and uh, so yeah it was just on the spot we would run through them in the morning then we would film them and so last minute fight scenes and they yeah they turned out decent for just last minute throwing everything together amen amen so you know we started working on the movie script and you know zach has a really good mind as far as putting things together writing but obviously he has no MMA background. And so I wanted, you know, the fight scenes to look good. And so I had to reach out to Pat and he, he's done an excellent job um, in the script. And then we have uh, Brett. Brett, how do you pronounce your last name? Is it Prieto? Yeah, Prieto. You know, what's funny. Prieto. It's Crookshank, the blue collar scholar. <laughs> he texts me today with a, with a voice, with an audio message goes, Hey Brett, how's it going? He goes, I just gotta know, how do you say your last name? He goes, is it, is it Frito? Is it Prieto? Like Prieto? And I so, but that's the thing, it's always the mystery. Everyone's like, is it they say Prado, Preto, Preto, and it's it's Prieto. 
So it's Spanish. Gotcha. So all, but all my Mexican and Spanish friends will say it's Prieto. So they'll say, hey, oh, Prieto. But my, <laughs> my last name means dark. So they laugh oh. every time I tell them my last name. They go, Prieto? <laughs> they go, no, 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 no. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> now now tell, us, tell us about some of the movies you've been in and, and working yeah. in a little bit. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so um, I... I so I've been in a few feature films. Uh, I was in a movie called uh, Hollywood Road Trip. It was actually my first feature that I ever did. That was back in, we, we filmed, I think, in 2010 or 11. But I had done some short films uh, leading up to that. I was in L.A. kicking around for a while. I was on, I was, I was basically a background guy. I was doing, uh, you know, I was on Las Vegas, CSI. Uh, so spoiler alert, CSI New York, CSI Miami, all shooting L.A. guys. So sorry. Uh, if, if, if I bursted your bubble, <laughs> but it's, so I, Criminal Minds, I was on all that stuff. And then I got a regular spot on the TV show Scrubs. So I was a featured extra in that, was still doing some commercials. And then I got out of that, uh, went to the police academy, became a cop. And then from there, I actually started booking more short films. And then people were seeing my short films. That's how I, uh, I pretty much got this role in Hollywood road trips. Some LA producers drove up to Fresno, California. That's where I was living at. And then from there, it was just kind of a snowball effect. I ended up being on a movie called Firefall and Epic Family Adventure was the subtitle. I also helped produce that. And then was on another film in between there. And then from there, um, I got my spot in. So I, I have a martial arts background as well. So they're looking for a guy who could act and, do martial arts, so I'd fit the bill. I auditioned for um, Alan Autry, who was the director for that. He was Bubba on the in, in the Heat of the Night, if you remember that. So I got in. That's how I got in to Victory by Submission, which you can watch on YouTube right now for free. It's also on different streaming platforms and whatnot. But on that movie, Eric Roberts is on it. Fred Williamson's on it. Um, Rachel Hendricks, who was on October Baby and uh, The Perfect Way with Scott Eastwood, who's Clint Eastwood's son, looks just like him, but. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's uh, th those are some of the features I've been in. I've been in some shorts since then. And uh, lastly, I recently just wrote a uh, screenplay. It won Best Genre Script at the Nashville Film Festival and has also been a finalist in others. And I've pitched to a few big studios that script in the last few weeks. So pretty exciting stuff. But with that, I'll shut my mouth and I will uh, uh, pass off the time. <laughs> Sorry. Oh yeah, no Brett, problem. You, you forgot, Brett. You forgot to mention Lee Majors, bro. Oh, how can I forget the how Fall forget? Guy? Oh, was that man. the Million Dollar Man? Yeah, yeah, Six Million Dollar Man. He was in Victory by Submission. Yeah, Boy. and Lee Lee Lee's a great guy. The day he was on set, it was stinking hot. So Fresno, everyone thinks California is like just just the beach and it's seventy degrees, but in the summertime in Fresno, Fresno it's a desert and you're in a big valley. So. It gets up to 110, sometimes 114 degrees. And Lee was dog tired that day. He shot for two days straight, and it was about 110 degrees. So I, him and I were kind of like two ships in the night. I wasn't shooting that day, and I was hanging out in his trailer, which was my my uncle's trailer. My uncle was donating his trailer, so he was just kind of like the the the, the, the he, he basically he was the uh, holding area for all the stars. They'd go into his trailer and hang out. So I was hanging with my uncle, and Lee came in, and I was walking out. We had a little exchange. Hey, how are you? You know, that type of thing. And it, you could tell he was just worn out. I mean, just old man tired. I was like, oh, it's nice to meet you, Mr. Majors. You know, have a good one, that sort of thing. But he was an awesome guy. I mean, he he did, he did his job. And if you watch the film, he's fantastic in it. I mean, he just he just jumps off the screen. So he's, he's a movie star. He really did. And to give everyone the background, how I met you, Brett, was um, we had the script done. I was praying. And I said, you know, Lord, it would be great for the for the main character, Chris Hunt, if you can find me a full preterist actor that knows mixed martial arts or that is at least athletic enough that could play that role. I don't know. That's how, a, it, that's it was a wild least, prayer. It, 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 <laughs> yeah. it, it was about three or four weeks go by. All of a sudden, we have a mutual friend, Bob. Bob has on his Facebook, you know, your movie and i'm like dude you've got to get this guy you know my script and um he goes oh he already knows you he says he watches you know uh preterist apologetics with you and don all the time yeah he's like wow this is this is 
really <laughs> weird. I mean, that's so, I mean, that's a finding a needle in a haystack. I mean, that's uh, sure that kind of an answer to prayer, you know, is, is really rare in my life anyway, but so that was cool. And then Jared Kuhn, Jared, tell us a little bit about you. I, I looked at your resume, dude, you are, the Lord has put you through some, I mean, you have that, that uh, police background like Brett, but you also right. have some military. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I did four years in the Navy. After that, I did uh, law enforcement for a very short amount of time. And then I went to work for the clandestine arm of the United States government um, as a contractor in the Middle East. So I did that for 10 years. Um, got to see the world. Uh, some really great training. Um, after that, I bought, about five years ago, I bought a private uh, security company uh, where we do um, private investigation, surveillance, stuff like that. So been a Christian since 2005, um, but I'm just under a year as far as being full preterist. So I've been trying to play catch up to all you guys and get my feet under me. Well, I, I think you're doing well. Like I said, you, you've read every book that Don Preston has written. So I think you're already ahead of a lot of us. And uh, it was kind of cool with Jared because I had reached out to Kirk Cameron because I thought, I wanted him to play the role of, uh, was it Dr. Richter, uh, where, you know, he's the preterist debater that debates the Muslim. And although it's not the main character, it is pretty much the climax of the movie. You know, uh, Chris Hunt is going to be fighting and you're going to be debating and, and we go back and forth. And right. Kirk just never got back to me. You know, I heard some stuff like, you know, he's just real busy. And I was just really bummed. And I was just like, well, Lord, you know, if, th if this is something you want to do, you're just, you're just going to have to show me. And it wasn't within maybe a couple of weeks. You reached out to me and said, hey, I guess I had mentioned the movie scripts in a show with Don. And you heard about right. it like, hey, you know, I have a background in, in some acting. And if you need any yeah. help with, with the project, please reach out to me. And I was like, well, and then you shared with me your background with Islam, right? Because you were in the Middle East. You That's right interacted yeah. a lot with. yeah i have uh fairly well read on uh, on islam and many of the dynamics there so um yeah i think uh we can add a lot of background to you know the, the iranian situation and we you and i talked a little bit about hezbollah yeah. versus afghanistan so Act, yeah yeah your your uh input was uh very good all right let's talk quickly about the goals of the movie all right. Um, what what we want to achieve is kind of threefold. First, I want to wake people up to the New World Order, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers. What have they been doing with their money for so long, right? Um, and I think as a country, and Pat, maybe you can kind of speak to this a little bit. I think we are starting to wake up. We have so many people saying, Biden's not the president, really. I mean, he's not really making the decisions. He's a puppet. But then we have everyone just clueless as to who is in charge. And they say it's Obama. But we really know that there's some people even above Obama that's really pulling these strings, correct? Oh, way above, way above Obama, way above Trump, way above. I mean, they're not, they're just, they're just uh, pretty much slaves, you know, soldiers, uh, I would rank them as like colonels, maybe if that, uh, maybe sergeant, you know, in the operating, uh, you know, the operations of the world. I mean, there's, you know, the bloodlines that have always run this planet. And uh, that's, that's pretty clear. I mean, they go back to, you know, Egypt, Babylon, you know, all the way through uh, control. I mean, if you, there's a reason there's, there's no, uh, genetic testing in the state of Israel. I mean, it's, you'll get thrown in prison if you um, if you get caught with a 23andMe test, right? Wow. So, and there's, you know, at least the English family, the English royal family admits that they're German, <laughs> right. you know? So, you know, all of these, all these, this, this web, this structure um, of these bloodlines and all of that, I mean, that's, they they will dispose of someone deemed very powerful. They killed a 
a sitting president in uh, the 60s in broad daylight in downtown Dallas, Texas. They will do whatever whatever they deem necessary and dispose of anyone that doesn't follow their orders at any given time. So that's pretty much the gist of it, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been studying, obviously, preterism for over 30 years, but studying kind of the New World Order, you know, this great reset, the Rothschilds and stuff for probably about maybe eight years now. And what I what I began seeing is, you know, connecting the data points. And what I saw was, OK, I looked at the Albert Pike letter and I saw all this other stuff that was they're planning <laughs> World War Three to be between Israel and the Muslim world. It's been talked about for a long time. And what I saw is the Rothschilds were putting their money. They always want to control everything. Right. Academia. Um, Hollywood, I mean, you name it, they've got their their hands and everything. But when it comes to trying to pervert Christianity, I saw early on that the Rothschilds began funding and dumping money all into Darby and especially Schofield. And premillennialism historically has been a heresy because all of your early church fathers were mostly all millennialist. But this this concept of a of a physical kingdom on earth was just on par with Jewish myths is is what the uh, the creedal has said, and so you can see why they began funding premillennialism, evangelical Zionism because it fits with their narrative to, to have them to want this war, right? And so they've been conditioning and they've been doing a great job. I mean, guys like John Hagee, right? They're going in there lobbying the politicians. We got to attack Iran. We got to do a preemptive. Why? Because they think that they're going to get raptured off the planet. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Rockefellers with their money and trying to influence Christianity through the liberal higher skeptic movement. Oh, you know, how do you know Paul wrote this? And miracles in the New Testament, come on. And their big argument is the one that we specialize in as preterists. Come on, you can't trust the New Testament. Jesus said his second coming was going to take place in his generation. All the New Testament authors said the same thing. The Bible is crap. It's not inspired. But hey, Christians, guess what? We got some good moral teachings here. Now we can fit it into the one world religion that the Rockefellers have been working on for a very long time. They've already taken over the medical system. I mean, you know, point blank. So the point of the movie is to expose the players behind the scenes, right? In our opening scene, we have the call, right? To activate a terrorist cell. These are the guys that are calling the shots. And then we have them manipulating these evangelical Zionists. And with this bad eschatology, it's a recipe for disaster with these three world religions trying to self-fulfill some end time war with the Rothschilds wanting that war to bankrupt the countries. So they already have their CBDCs, right? They already have their digital world currency ready to go. They just need a, a crisis to continue to weaken the nations to roll it out. And does that sound about right as far as what you guys have been seeing? Yep. Well, I guess I can elaborate in, in terms of uh, you know, I'm no biblical scholar by any means, I can tell you that. I just know that through a lot of archaeology, a lot of um, a lot that's been written, uh, a lot of old text, um, Sumerian text, and a lot of other things that, you know, this, the almost the extinguishing of mankind has happened, you know, in history before, you know, the mud floods and all that, all of that has taken place before. You know, so, but it, overall, when I look at, <clears throat> say, for instance, the the creation of the Israeli state, right, the Balfour Agreement, leading up to the Rockefellers putting a bunch of money in, um, you know, the even the people of Israel aren't aware that, uh, at least most of them, and certainly a very, very a minute amount of American citizens understand things like, well, Number one, America has created a lot of terrorist organizations, you know, 
We're talking the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. We're talking uh, ISIS, Al Qaeda, you know, on and on and on. Right. And we were talking about that uh, when Obama was in and saying, yeah, the Clinton administration. Yeah, they're they're funneling money from heroin trade uh, to weapons manufacturers, which was uh, being they were being manufactured in Bulgaria at the time, I believe. Uh, and those weapons were being shipped uh, via a cargo plane company and then a ship called the Marian Danica uh, into Turkey and Libya. And then the weapons were being delivered over into uh, Syria. Right. And that was and everybody went, you guys are insane. Well, the documents eventually came out and you know proved that we were correct. But American citizens and, and Israeli citizens who live there, uh, you know, Hamas is an Israeli uh registered corporation um, yeah you know, the muslim brotherhood which was founded in i think 1938 by the suez canal employees that the suez canal company corporation at the time was owned by the rothschilds and money from the suez canal corporation was donated to help fund the muslim brotherhood and then a member of one of the high-ranking members of the muslim brotherhood in 1976 or 78, founded Hamas. And so it's a registered corporation. And, and that's what I'll ask people. I'll go, you know, just by any, uh, by chance, you know, can you explain why Hamas is a uh, a corporation that's registered in Israel? What would that be? You know, uh, there, there's some funky stuff going on. So, you know, sure everything we're seeing is literally a TV show. Everything we're seeing is fabricated, created, um, and you, you think about the most, the most strict, most secure border in the world Yeah, had people, had people jogging through it, had people driving through it and had 200 guys in friggin' paragliders just cruising around going over the border. And then for seven hours having free range and doing whatever they wanted. Okay. We've got to, at some point admit that we've. Uh, we're falling for the banana and the tailpipe and a lot of this stuff, right? Um, everything's being fabricated and, and all of it. So, I mean... You know, um, there's, there's different kinds of false flags. And one of them is when you know the intel that, that the enemy is going to attack and you let them. But as you're pointing out, it even goes deeper than that in that Israel actually funded and started the organization. So, it, so it's kind of a controlled opposition. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily... I don't necessarily say anything for sure. I'm just saying right. people need to look into it and people need to look into it um, because, you know, we've observed that stuff. It's like when you go back to um, when, you know, John McCain made a trip over to Syria and he comes out outside of this building that he was meeting with all these guys and he's standing there with, uh, gosh, what was it? Seven or 10 guys. And, many of them were identified as literally one of them was a uh, actually a famous terrorist leader. And so I call up my friend who was an intelligence, former intelligence guy. And I go, he's, uh, I go, dude, seriously, I go, McCain's on there calling these guys, the free Syrian army. We're doing it again. And he goes, of course we are, you know, of course. So that's the, it's a never ending, um, you know, and we're going to see a lot of false flags in the United States coming up here pretty soon. Yeah, you know, and and, and that's coming. and that's that's the core theme of the movie, right? Is we're we're gonna have this Muslim terrorist attack. We all see it; it's coming to drag us into this war. And we have so many evangelical Zionists saying, "Yes, we want this war because we're gonna get raptured." And so, the third objection, or this, the, or the third objective, is to kind of expose people to preterism. Now. In this movie, you know, liberals uh, and most Christians aren't into the liberal world. Like they got saved in some mega church with the fog machines and the and the cool pastor with his skinny jeans. All right. And they that's all they've known is premillennial dispensationalism. But outside of that, in academia, there's a lot of people that see that Christ taught that his second coming was going to take place in the first century. And you've got all these liberals attacking this particular branch of Christianity, and they don't know what to do with it, right? And we've got a character in the movie 
who is faced with that. He loses his parents. God has failed me. Then he's looking at the liberal skeptics going, well, look, Jesus totally failed. He failed his followers. He failed me. Screw Christianity, right? Basically. And there have been a lot of people that have come to Christ through preterism because this is the only thing that makes sense. And so that's what I want to do. I want to expose the new world order for what's going to happen next. And we all know what's going to happen next. It's going to be the Muslim terrorist attack to get us all emotional and pumped up. The rapture's coming, blah, blah, blah. And we want to introduce preterism as an antidote to this particular problem as best that, we can. Right. That, preter that preterism is crazy talk. That's crazy <laughs> talk. I, 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 got I got baptized in a blow up baby pool. And that preterism is crazy. That's crazy talk. <laughs> I know it goes. It goes against the tradition of a lot. I mean, I think you were raised Roman Catholic. Um, yeah. It it goes against the grain of just about all of our backgrounds, right, guys? Oh yeah. You know, definitely. I got in trouble. I got in trouble when I was calling fights one time. I said, um, <laughs> I, I, I I got yelled at numerous times for things that I said during fight broadcasts. But uh, one time, a guy was just mauling another guy, and I said, um, "He's a, he, he's all over him like a like a Catholic priest on an altar boy." Oh God! <laughs> oh no! Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. My well, my director, my director and producer, did not take kindly to that one. Well, I would think with your audience that would have, that would that should be fair ball, but that's all good. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but uh, no, but the thing you were talking about, you know, with with the state of Israel, uh, you know, the people that run the world, you know, we have to remember are not Hebrew by genetics. Right. Yeah. They're, they, they claim, obviously, um, you know, Judaism, but they're certainly not Hebrews. And what I ask people also is besides the Palestinians, where are the where's the other 12 or 11 tribes of of Israel, where'd they go? And they're like, what are you talking about, Militich? And they're like, well, <clears throat> I mean, I'm pretty sure that if they were Hebrews, they'd allow uh, 23andMe tests in the country. That's all I know. And, and obviously there are, you know, Hebrews in Israel. I'm just saying the people that run run the, the show over there. And, you know, if we go back in, in history, uh, Turkic bloodlines, uh, certain folks, those bloodlines through all history have had two mortal enemies, the Persians and the Russians. And who are we up against right now? Who are we getting tricked into potentially going into World War III with? Attacking Iran and, and Russia potentially, right? Yeah, I find it interesting in the prophetic, I mean, the, the prophetic literature of, of John Hagee and, and Hal Lindsey Russia is always the bad person that we have to look out for. Israel is always this innocent, good, that good country that we're supposed to unquestionably support. And you start thinking about it historically. Well, didn't Russia help us with with the English? You know, I mean, Russia came to our aid a, a, quite a few times. There, so you, you can kind of see even in the with the within the prophecy experts that they've conditioned us to think. Oh, well, Russia's going to attack Israel, obviously, in Gog and Magog, because this tribe sounds like Rosh. Russia, you know. Because they're all. Rosh. Yeah. Right. It, right. The sound of like hermeneutic. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. But um, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Brett. Oh, no, what I was going to say is uh, just kind of dovetailing off what Pat was saying is um, it's really interesting, too, uh, when, when you do look back on, like you listen to different quotes from different leaders from uh, Israel, like military, like once upon a time, like circa 1980, the, those guys that were in leadership, you talk to them now, not that I talk to them, but you hear different little quotes from them or sound bites. They say, when they talk about Hamas, they say Hamas was our biggest mistake because they're claiming ownership that they invented this Frankenstein monster and it got out of control. But if you really want to see a pre mill dispensationalist get hot, you tell them, you know, Israel created Hamas. Because I, I've done that. And they get hot. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. And they go, look at your history. Just look at history. History doesn't lie. I mean, look, look at who was behind Hamas, who created them, right? And 
when it comes to uh, talking about like there. So when you start talking about what happened on that day when the paragliders came down, I was at dinner and I asked a simple question. I said, my question is this. I'm just asking the question. Why? Why was the Iron Dome? I mean, a donkey couldn't cut a wet fart by that thing without the military getting out there. Right. Right. I mean, it's true. And all of a sudden, these guys are just coming in like it's a country club. No big deal. And how this this open air prison, which uh, is in Gaza, these guys had mock a mock little city, if you will, set up how they were going to infiltrate this thing with the amount of drones that are flying around and how Israel has so much has such a strong military. How did they not do some recon on this open air prison to see that these guys were training for this? And Mike, I asked that question, and it was uh, there, there, there. There was a hack. There had to be a hack. You go. Well, do you know that, or is that just you conjecturing? They have no answer. They they have to try and find some way out because they have to defend the, their their sacred cow. Because again, like you were saying, Mike is John Hagee, uh, Greg Laurie. I, I like Greg. I do. And David Jeremiah. These guys. They've built an empire on last days madness to to, to uh, take gary's term but it's true as it's last day's madness and we go look we th these are the chosen people so god has a special plan for them down the road even though in their eschatology two-thirds of them are going to be slaughtered no big deal mm -hmm. but like john hagee said he when he gets raptured he's going to be on the balcony of heaven watching the tribulation and you go well man that sounds that sounds hopeful john <laughs> it's like geez man yeah. But anyway, I, I didn't want that thought to slip out of my head uh, because Pat was making some points. But like I was saying, if you start questioning these people, just asking questions, they get hot. You go, look, I'm just asking questions. And I think they get hot about it because they've never investigated it for themselves. They're just hearing it from the pulpit and nodding because they're they're, they're they play right. my pet pastor. Well, my favorite pastor says so. Well, Johnny Mac, he's not wrong on this because he's got the MacArthur Study Bible. And he go, look, I love John, but this is where John is not, he's not sound in this area right here. Right. So, right. Well, you know, if, if they can justify <clears throat> the Rothschilds coming in, buying the land, buying all of the, uh, the political buildings, you know, I mean, it's the state of Rothschild. It is not <clears throat> a fulfillment of any prophecy, Old and New Testament, you know, and that's what I get into in, in the book as I go through all of their proof texts. That modern Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy and just blow them out of the water. Sure. But and that's, and I, I was actually going to just kind of just uh, sorry to interrupt you, Mike, but I was thinking about your book as you were saying that because obviously 1948, they'll always say 1948 is, hey, that's when, uh, that's when Israel became a nation again. But, they, but per Leviticus 17, correct me if I'm wrong on that, on that address right there, or Deuteronomy 28. God's not going to give, he's not going to give unrepentant Israel back their land. So you have a bunch of unrepentant Jews going back into the land. That'd be completely against Torah, be against God's law to allow them back in there. You have a bunch of non-believers walking back in the land of Israel. And from your book, it wasn't like they just kind of waltzed in there, right? They didn't just come like, oh my gosh, the the, the the sea is parted again, and here we are. We're just kind of floating back into the land. Uh, maybe you can expound upon that a little bit more, Mike. Well, let me <clears throat> tie, tie in what you're saying and what Pat has introduced earlier yeah. as far as genetics. And, and this is where they just come out with the knives, okay? But we have to say it. I, I, I'm just an honest guy. All right. When Christ came upon the clouds in AD 70, through the Roman armies, just as God had come upon the clouds in the Old Testament, through the Assyrians, through the Babylonians. This is not literal language. It's apocalyptic, it's metaphoric judgment. language. Yeah, judgment okay. yeah. So when he came through, what did he do? He burned the temple. Where were the genealogical records kept? In the temple. Post AD 70, no one can prove what tribe they're from because Christ made sure it was a done deal. And you asked, you even asked Michael Brown, a, a Messianic Jew apologist. Hey, he's from the tribe of Judah. He's from the tribe of Judah. Just ask well, him. No, he says, he says, I think I'm from. Okay, yeah. let's let's drill down on that, Mike. Why why do you say you think? You mean you don't know? Well, well there's a reason you don't know. Okay, so there are no racial Jews today. At least they can't prove it. 
they can't prove they're from a certain tribe. And if you can't prove you're from a certain tribe, you're not a Jew. And and there can be no Judaism because you can't have any Levites and you can't have any sacrifice. Who cares if you build a temple? If you can't prove what Mm -hmm. tribe you're from, the whole system is a joke. So genealogically, there's no racial Jews post-8070. Now, if you're going to define a Jew based upon religion, which uh, one of their encyclopedias does, they know that there's no race of Jews. You can even go to their own encyclopedia and it says it, that they come from Khazaria, most of them. Mm -hmm. So if they say they're a Jew based upon religion, embracing Judaism, that's a that won't work either because post AD 70, there's no old covenant. There's no covenant relationship. God broke and ended that covenant with the destruction of the temple. So there is no Jew. So we got the biggest scam. We got two scams. Jesus is still coming, right? Carrot and stick, just like, uh, you know, just like um, the green fraud, you know, the climate change thing. The world's going to end every 12 years. And then, then we have the premillennial dispensational. Jesus is coming. The end's here. It's coming. So we never build any kind of long-term strategy. We never identify the enemy and build that long, you know, a, a strategic plan. And that's what preterism does. If we can wake up some of these people to actually study their Bibles, um, you know, and that's one of the objection or objectives of the movie. It's hard. It's hard to break, break tradition, Mike, because the people oh. have been so ingrained with it, and they're held captive to a concept. And I'm not saying that these people are. The, so it, it can be very cultish this way of thinking, and I'm not saying they're in a cult by any stretch of the word. But I do a lot of evangelism with Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Mormons. When you talk to them and you present something to them that's foreign that they've never heard before, but they're seeing it. There's, they see it. I mean, you show them from Scripture, right? It, if you can just have them read it, they see it. And I've had Mormons tell me when I show them from their own prophets, quote unquote, that but Brigham Young. So Brigham Young, in one of his prophecies, he said that that Heavenly Father literally had sex with Mary, and that's how they bore Jesus. So when I've pointed that out, say, do you believe this? And they'll read it out loud of what he said. I, I, I kid you not. You could go on my YouTube channel. In this conversation, one of the kids, because essentially they are kids, they send these 18-year-olds out to be slaughtered by people that actually know their Bible. And they'll read it, and they go, there has to be a way around this. That's exactly what the kid said. There has to be a way around this. It doesn't fit and my system. doesn't fit my It's not my the paradigm. Body. It doesn't fit the paradigm. And... Johnny Mac, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on Johnny Mac, but at the same time, I kind of I am because he espouses this. I mean, if you read his study Bible, you go, they'll go, look, that's not what John MacArthur says. We're supposed to be raptured in chapter four of Revelation. You go, show me where it says that. Well, I know the word rapture mm-hmm. is in the Bible, but the word Trinity isn't either. Okay, I can prove to you the Trinity, though, because that's just a word that codifies what is. But in a rapture, you're saying the whole church is getting just whisked up and nothing and nothing but their underwear and their clothes are laying around. But it doesn't say that. This is a letter to the seven churches. It says in chapter one, out the gate, it's a book of signs. These things are shortly to take place. Verse three, these things are at hand, Ingus. And then it says that in, in verse nine of chapter one, he's a partake, John, your brother and partaker in the tribulation. They're in it right there. And it's him that's being taken up in chapter four. Nothing about the church. But yeah. When you show them this, it the, the, the brain scrambles. I mean, they, they freeze. And I was telling Rick this a couple weeks back, as I have somebody that's very close to me. And I was working on this with her for a long time because pre-mill is just embedded. I, I gave her as Jesus Coming Soon by Damar. She reads and goes, oh, my gosh, this makes sense. Because it's clean. When you start looking at Matthew 23 and Matthew 24, even 25, all in a unit, you go, oh, this is clear as day. He's talking about the temple. Yeah. There's not going to be one stone left upon another. It's not going to be cast down. She sees this, my friend. However, she's charismatic. So mm-hmm. in a conversation we got into as we've been, you know, as I've kind of been massaging this thing and showing her historical evidences and internal evidences, 
she says the reason why I'm I believe in the the full gospel is why, what she calls it. A lot of charismatics say this is the full gospel, especially people that are foursquare, which she was and would still claim that she is. Um, when she said, there's nowhere it says the gifts have ceased. And I go, Daniel 9. And she goes, what? And I say it again. Yeah, verse 24. Mm -hmm. Yep, you got it. Exactly. So I read that to her and I say, there's no gap in between the 69th and 70th week. And she immediately froze. It was deer in headlights. And I kid you not, Mike, uh, she went back to factory reset mode right after that. Everything that I had told her, all that work for the past three years of all this, it was completely just thrown out the window. She went completely back to Maranatha, Maranatha. He's coming anytime. Um, the, the, the tribulation's yeah. right around the corner. Who, 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 who's the beast? Oh, it could be uh, this guy. Oh, it could be that guy. And you're going, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're doing this. I can't, yeah. I cannot believe this just happened. So, yeah. but that's what yeah, they get. But, they get more. They get more preoccupied with Satan and who they think is the Antichrist. And yeah, I mean, it's it's a totally different concept. Real quick, Rick, where are we on time? Uh, we we're about forty minutes in. We got about twenty minutes till we get twenty to minutes. An hour. Okay, good. So for the remaining time, let's talk about the movie itself. Maybe try and summarize it to some of the listeners. And and try and talk about some obstacles and get into the nuts and bolts of this. You know, the budget. Um, what are our goals? What's realistic? What's not realistic? And, and that. Does that does that sound good to you guys? Oh, yeah. yeah. Can I jump in for a second, Mike? Yes. Okay. Do you do any of you guys know what like the number one Christian movie uh studio is right now? Is it it's eight? either a firm, it's a firm, but I know Sony bought a firm. So uh, it's either going to be Pure Flix or a firm, but it's Sony owns are, a firm. Are you, are you familiar with Angel Studios? Yeah, yeah. So, eight, but what, is that is it LDS or is it Christian? It's Christian, and that is it's Dallas Jenkins. He's the son of Jerry B. Jenkins, the writer okay, of Left Behind. Right. right. Okay. So mm -hmm. this show. Uh, of course, I love the show. It's actually really good. I enjoy it. But right out of the gate, they start playing with the word soon. As soon as they introduce Jesus, if they say something soon, they're always arguing about, well, and he's like, I don't think soon means what you think it means. So I already know where they're heading. They're they're heading sure. yeah. premillennial dispensational. They're, you know, they're, they're going to play with that word soon. But here's the thing. It's the largest crowdfunded Christian studio in history. They have served billions of people, this media. As it stands, as it stands right now, they have a movie in the theater right this second. That's The Chosen. The Chosen is their number one show. It was 100% crowdfunded. Mm. And the thing is, what we've learned, kind of like with the Trump administration or with this, like The Chosen, is that people are they want something different than what's being presented to them by the media or by Hollywood. They, they just do. Yeah. You, you're, you know, the reason the chosen is so successful is because there are a lot of people out there that are quiet believers that aren't out there saying everything and they're ready to support. I, my wife and I went to see the first uh, three episodes of season four in the theater just two weeks ago and we stopped and we're talking to one of our old teachers. She's just, she's a very unassuming person. And she, what does she say? We donate $60 a month to Angel Studios so they can keep producing this. They're wow. just normal people that give $60 a month because they like what they see. And so, in my opinion, if you're going to get your message across in this film, Mike, it's going to have to be crowdfunded because you're not going to find anybody in a large studio or a well, I, I don't want to just like say you won't find anybody. The Lord can do whatever he wants. If the Lord wants to make this movie, he'll make it, okay? But I'm just saying that what I'm seeing, the trend that I'm seeing is that people that believe in something or see something, they will get involved. And so I think it's important that we tell the Preterist community what we're doing here for sure. And then also like the communities that Pat's in or, you know, that – People that whether it's MMA or if it's um, the psyops or if it's about the Rothschilds or whatever, let everybody know the idea about this movie is to bring attention to it 
but it's based in truth and not in just uh, what they're used to, which is a bunch of, you know, crap in the, in the movies and crap on TV. You know, it's actually based in truth. That's why I like the debate in this film because it, you're seeing the action, but at the same time, you're getting this truth and it's gonna if people pay attention to it they might actually look i did once i finally saw what apocalyptic language was i was i was all about it because my whole life i drank the kool-aid of the premillennial dispensational movement my whole life yeah. and it was very confused mm -hmm. i was very frustrated and one thing i do know is that it is failing miserably i interviewed a man by the name of daniel hummel who wrote a book called uh, the rise and fall of dispensationalism and mm. yeah he's a fundamentalist and he's writing it you know he he's a historic premillennial but he wrote this book like dispensationalism is collapsing slowly over time and i think it, i think that the country is just wedded for this kind of material rick so uh, you, you mentioned up. you mentioned something really interesting is because when this war takes place and i believe yes. it will take place you're going to have so many Christians, their world is just, because their faith is on trying to find the Antichrist. Ooh, the book of Revelation is all about me, right? We're all narcissists, really. Every, the end of the world's got to be about me. He's going to come in my lifetime for sure, you know? And when that war is done and the rapture doesn't take place, we're going to have a, millions of Christians. Mass exodus. Totally just blown away, like, what happened? And look at what COVID has done. <clears throat> COVID has exposed the Rockefellers and Big Pharma, the experts, right? That's what technocracy is all about, is setting up experts that are going to rule the world. They want scientists, engineers, and bankers to run the world. It's the expert class. And the, and the public has learned, wait, Fauci really isn't a health expert he's something totally different he's a depopulationist he's connected to some other people and i think in the world of religion when this war takes place and I, what i want this movie to be is we're going to be there to pick up the pieces okay well let's get back to the bible okay guys let's not be narcissistic jesus isn't coming soon for you in your generation he promised it in that first century generation. And so that's kind of what we want to do is, is kind of be there ready to help these people now and when this collapse happens and be there as predicting everything that's going to happen as it unfolds to, to, you know, to have credibility as well. Yeah. And you've already, you make a great point. It, it, it is, we're, we're just we're at this place as a nation where we're so inundated with all of this fakeness wokeness and all of these other things that are coming at us and there's a lot of people that are just they're sick and tired of it and they're turning to other avenues and so i i agree i think that you're right i think that when the war comes and it happens People are going to be shocked. I just got out of a church just two months ago that I swear to you is rapture every single service. Yeah, right. And it's just, it's rampant uh, in, in my area. And I can only speak for Western North Carolina, but I can just tell you it's rampant here. So let me, because time is short, <clears throat> I want to kind of get down to the nitty gritty. You go uh, ahead. We'll, in another show, maybe we'll kind of summarize the movie script. I, I really want to talk about the budget um, and, and where we're looking at. So China owns a lot of Hollywood and then Zionists own a lot of Hollywood. And yet we've got some outliers, some guys like Mel Gibson that have made some money that are looking for different things. We know Mel Gibson is not, he hates Zionism. He knows all about the Rothschilds. So I think he would definitely be interested in something like this. He has a Roman Catholic background, so the preterism, I don't know. I, I wish I could sit down with the guy maybe someday. You know, I don't know. But um, so so budget-wise, let me ask you this, Brett, straight up. How much – what was your budget for Victory by Submission? So Victory by Submission obviously was, was independent, and right. 
So I, I want to was... look at I want to look at alternatives. So if we can't sure. we can't go through the China and the Zionist route, sure. we're looking sure. at alternatives. So what's our budget on something like that? Yeah. So Vitro Price Commission, it, it was a little over a million dollars, maybe two two million bucks. Okay. Um, and uh, we, we had a good team around us. It was really good. Um, but yeah, when it comes to indies, there's guys like like Daily Wire, for example, uh, Dallas Gagne. He is, he's been in the game for a very long time. Uh, Dallas is a few years older than me. I, I've had communication with Dallas. Um, Dallas, he produced Bone Tomahawk with Kurt Russell and Richard Jenkins. He produced Drag Across Concrete with uh, Vince Vaughn and Mel Gibson. So he, if it, he's a guy who, who is a big, he, he's a big champion for, look, you don't need these gigantic budgets. You can make high quality films for a lot less money when you, because if you put, because you don't need it, because where a lot of money goes in a lot of films is, oh, the assistant needs an assistant to an assistant. And this guy needs this. You just have different moving parts. Where you, go, you don't need this guy over here behind the scenes. You don't need that. If you have an outstanding line producer, a line producer is the guy that goes, look, I'm setting the schedule. It's going to be a 30-day shoot. We need to be in these locations right here on this date. And if we have Lee Majors... He can only shoot for two days, and we're only paying for two days for Lee. It's going to be 20 Gs for two days for Lee Majors. we got to shoot him out because what happens if we go to day three, it's going to be even more money. So now your budget starts to it starts to get bloated. So you a line producer is key. I mean, that's the key. That's the guy that is going to, like I said, put things on track. Obviously, having a good director attached. That director, he's going to want his director of photography with him. And that's the guy that sets up the scenes. He's going to have his, his grip and everyone set up the lighting for him. Um, but right like right now, as the script sits, I, I'm still working through it to actually kind of see, okay, what would this budget be like? Like for my film that I wrote, this script, I, when I pitched it the other day, I told, they go, what, what do you think this budget would be, Brad? I said, about 15 or 20 million because you do have to factor in your star power. Because in order to get distribution, from my experience, you need to have a name on your film. You have to have somebody. Because if you have a bunch of, you know, no-namers on there, it's going to be hard to get distribution. And I know the way Dallas works, Sonia over at uh, Daily Wire, and, we, and also Bonfire Legends, his company, he will get stars attached. Because what's going to happen is if you have your script, you got to raise some sort of funding because what's going to happen is that if, when you go, when you start soliciting agents, hey, we want to get, um, we've been talking about Mel Gibson. So, hey, we want Mel Gibson to be the star of this film. They go, okay, you guys have money in the bank? Well, no. They say, well, then don't talk to us. But say, yeah, we have money in the bank. We have a director attached. And they'll say, great, make me an offer. And then you go, okay, well, we can offer him uh you know, this much for, for, for the day or whatever it is. Okay. Well, send us the script. We'll see if he likes it. Maybe he's willing to, you know, take a pay cut, whatever it is. But all these guys have their number. They have their magic number, especially if they like the material. Some of these guys will take pay cuts like with bone Tomahawk that Dallas Sonia produced Kurt Russell and all those guys, they took pay cuts because they love the script. They went, I'll do this for, the, for this script. I'll, I'll, I'll work for scale or I don't know if they work for scale on that. Like scale, meaning, um, the SAG low budget, right? Because all that you go through the Screen Actors Guild and all that stuff. So it's it's a lot more complicated than one thinks because you start dealing with a lot of moving parts, right? A lot of people go, oh, let's go make a movie. And you think you can just go out, hey, let's get the cameras, let's put these people here. But once you start getting people involved, like line producers who keep track of your money, you have to have an LLC, it goes into an escrow account, you got your director attached and all that good stuff. He's going to want to start scouting. You're going to have your locations manager who's scouting out all these spots. So um, I, I think it can be done for a fairly low budget. I honestly do. I think you could do this thing for, I mean, Sound of Freedom, another Angel Studios deal. That costs like, like $7 million to $10 million to make, and it's an absolute juggernaut. Because all, these, because all these guys that are putting money into it, they want a guarantee going, look, there's never a guarantee, one. But two, I want to know I'm going to get my money back. So if you can guarantee you can get distribution, you're already in the black where you go, oh, shoot, we already have distribution. We're in the black. You never want to have a movie be in the red, right? Where you go over budget. So like I said, it's it's a lot, it's a lot of moving parts. But again, I, I don't think it has to be a big $30 million budget. I think you could cut that in half, honestly. I think you could work 
anywhere from it's the kind of a wider margin. I think you could go anywhere from eight to fifteen million uh, within there. I do. I I I could be wrong about that, um, but that's that's my that's my thought. Jared, what are your thoughts? Oh, we can't hear you. Is it? Is, is it talking? Is it? Is it from his end, Rick? He got raptured, Mike. <laughs> let me try. Let me try something. I'm gonna click on mute and then ask to unmute. Jared, do you see the mute button on there? No. Yeah, on the bottom left hand side of your screen. Oh well. Okay. Well, we're we're probably hitting about the the one hour mark. Um, and I, I know you guys have got stuff to do, but this is what we really need to pray about, I guess. Really, it, it kind of comes down to money, right? I mean, you can have a great script. Yeah, you can, you can have you can have all the actors in place, you can have all the right people in place. But it kind of comes down to money. And <clears throat> so I guess that's what we really need to get on our knees and start praying about. And if you could, Brett, continue going through the script, you know, make some changes, not huge changes, you know, but 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 good cosmetic. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And that's, and that's what I've been looking at. It's like I don't want to go go off the rails and go, oh, shoot, all of a sudden there's a plane that's hijacked and this is what's happening. No, no, it's. <laughs> it's dealing with the template of what we have going, okay, let's inject this thing with some steroids just a little bit to make it stronger, get it ready for the competition because that's really what it is. Like when I write scripts, I always do a throw up draft. It'll be like 200 and something pages. And they go, okay, I got to get this dude ready for competition. Now it's time to cut, cut, cut. That way he's shredded when it comes show time. So I want to make sure I'm, I, I'm bulking it up. Then I go, okay, now let's get down to brass tacks and make this thing the best can be. So when you do present it, because here's the thing too, as you know, Mike, is Christian films, they already have a stigma behind them where people go, oh, it's one of those faith-based things. But if it's got a little cojones to it and it also has a hook, you go, well, this is different. This is different. I like this. Preterism um, is very different. Yeah. Remember the, remember the Da Vinci Code? Oh, totally, yeah. It, it caused controversy and so you had people in churches in their Sunday school program trying to figure out if this was true or not and trying to refute it. So it took on a life outside of the movie, movie place. Oh, yeah. right? And and it was it actually functioned as free advertisement for the movie. And so we have a controversial aspect to this movie. We have the hook that will get people talking. We just got to get it out there somehow. Right, right. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like you said, it's uh, I got a fly in here, man. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've noticed. Gosh, it's like, but I got this ring light, and it's just like floating around me. I'm like, oh, my gosh, man, it's killing me. But, yeah, no, I mean, it really does boil down to budget. But, I mean, if you have, first off, you, the, the script is the spine of everything, right? So if you have the script, you have something tangible, and you get it to the right person, they read it, they go, shoot, I'm going to go pass this off to so-and-so. And then so-and-so reads it, and so-and-so knows Mel Gibson or just, you know, name a, a star. They go, I dig this. Who, who Who's responsible for this? Wait, oh, this was a book too? What the, what's the book about, right? And then now I want to, let's have a meeting. And then from there, it's, yeah, I think we can get a budget around this. I have investors that would like something like this. And then from there, you can get somebody attached, right? You get some funding. Hey, we have so-and-so attached. Because once the investors hear, oh, you have somebody attached to this thing? Wait, you have who? Oh, well, shoot, that's a guaranteed, I mean, that's guaranteed money back if you have him. Okay, here's some money, right? And that's what happened with Victory by Submission is once we had uh, Lee Majors and we had uh, gosh, Lee Majors and Fred Williamson, that's when dollars started rolling in. They went, oh, shoot, this, you guys make a movie. That's this is a movie. You know, this isn't some like backyard school project. I mean, you guys are making a feature film. So that's that's how it rolls, you know. Some 
I mean, that's not the exact formula, but that's kind of how it looks when it comes to making films. Okay. Jared, you got audio questions. now? Yeah, I just got it fixed now that the show's over. <laughs> no, no, no. That's... We're kind of we're kind of coming down to some closing comments, and then we'll we'll get together again here in a few weeks. But Jared, go ahead and give us uh, some of your thoughts. Uh, to piggyback off of what Rick was saying, I think in the wake of um, of COVID, people are looking for somebody to air their voice. They're they're smelling that something is up. A lot of these people are evangelical Christians, um, and so having a having a Christian based movie that's actually going to expose what's going on behind the curtain is, I think, going to do that. I think it's going to give them that voice. Um, and then, like you said, the antidote actually seeing you know, a Christian apologist used the Bible to smash uh, is an Islamic apologist. Um, I think that'll embolden them. So uh, what's so sad about dispensationalism is it's, it is a psyop. It is, you know, American, the American people are fighters by nature. Um, I mean, that's how we got our independence, you know, and we, we love our guns and we love uh, Christianity. And sadly, I think our adversary has used our, our faith and turned it into a faith of apathy where we just sit by and 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 wait for the rapture. And so if we could tap in um, to that fighting spirit of the American people, um, I think I think we could get the funding. Yeah, as far as name recognition, I did send the script, a couple of my books to uh, Alex Jones and I said, hey, and to his staff. And I said, hey, will you play this opening character? You know, because we have that opening scene where Pat's training with, you know, Brett and, or Chris Hunt. And you guys are training. You're listening to the podcast to the guy who wrote a book on the Great Reset. And he's kind of laying out what's going to happen, right? Yeah. And so if we can get Alex Jones just to play that real small point part. Mm -hmm. And then maybe at the end of the movie, when the credits are going up, when people get up. Boom, we're in the InfoWars um, set, and he's interacting with, with the actors. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping something like that could happen, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Pat, what do you think as far as Mel Gibson? Is he even, is he even possible to get to? You know, quite a while back, I was trying to get to him because I wrote uh, – a book about everything that's going on right now about a decade before it started called Operation Green Tip, where I took special forces operators who were contractors, uh, scientists um, who perfected time travel and banking history. And so their mission during a, a, the, uh, the collapse, which is coming, um, I had things backwards. I had the banking collapse, complete collapse first. Then it was you were forced to get vaccines and, and shipped and all that sort of stuff. So that's still going to happen. They just needed to obviously soften the battlefield first uh, before it happened. And I had tried reaching out um, to Mel Gibson several times because I wanted to explain the, you know, the book to him potentially for, for movie stuff. And um, I just couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I didn't have the connections to, to be able to do that, but uh um, but nonetheless, I think ultimately, I think the best thing to do <clears throat> is just for the hell of it, Mike, is you tell people Jesus is coming back for the third time just to make the Jews mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, they're all want, I mean, the Jews want their military Messiah to destroy the Muslims and the Christians. The Muslims want their version of the second coming and the coming of the Mahdi to destroy uh, the Christians and the Jews. Mm -hmm. And then the evangelical Zionists want a five foot five Jew floating down on a literal cloud to kill, you know, the Muslims, the Jews. And it's it's this circular self-fulfillment yeah. problem right. that we, I, have I, to, we have to break. I may have a little. I may have a little different view, but you know, ultimately, the way I look at it, in um, you know, Jews were enslaved, correct? In Egypt, you're talking about? Yeah, but um, the way I look at it, my okay. personal intuition is, we are the tribes of Israel. Mankind are the tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes 
the thirteenth tribe is run on the show. Hmm. That's the way I've always looked at it. I just saw it that way from a very early age. Uh, that mankind is Israelites, all the twelve tribes spread out, scattered amongst the earth. And the Hopi, the Hopi prophecies, the Hopi Indians want to meet with us because of what we're doing with soil. Um, and their Hopi prophecy is um, all the tribes, all the colors, uh, mankind of all the colors and the tribes will come together at the four corners and heal the earth and heal mankind. And it's, it's you know, when the Hopis, who don't meet with us white boys very often, uh, want to discuss things, there's something very interesting going on. That's all I can say. Hey. All right. So, uh, Rick, I guess we're probably at about the one hour mark, right? Yep. Yep. We're one and I, know hour you guys, I know you guys have to go. Um, all right, man, let me close this in prayer here and let's just uh, give it up to the Lord and, and we'll, we'll plan a couple more meetings and see how it goes. Lord, thank you so much for your providence. Lord, we see what's going on in the world. And Lord, even though there are some powerful men behind the scenes, Lord, you are on Mount Zion laughing when the nations say that they want to overthrow you. Lord, you are ultimately the puppet master. You are sovereign and you're in control. You raised up Pharaoh to show that you are powerful. Now in our generation, Lord, we have people thinking that they're gods. Klaus Schwab, Noah Harari, Lord. Lord, it's it's time for you to step in. And we know, Lord, at some point you will. And uh, there will be a great awakening, God. And I just pray, Lord, that you will just illumine your truth, Lord, with preterism, Lord, and, and help so many Christians that are locked into this cult mentality, Lord, that just has no battle plan, has no worldview. And it's just why why polish brass on a sinking ship and, and the church has got to get out of that mentality. If you can use us, you want to use this movie, Lord, we're here. And so we just pray that you would put some things in place through your providence. And we pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah.